Okay, thank you everybody for joining. And we are um, so happy that you came tonight because we are going to be listening to and participating um, in another really great session with Stephen Kaufman. And um, he is going to be talking about the profile of a great employee and who gets um, promoted. Um, as you know, Positive Charge puts on the series. And um, I don't know who does and does not know about Positive Charge, so we always tell you just a very quick snippet of what po Positive Charge is, who, it, who we are. Um, we are a nonprofit um, organization whose um, primary mission is to amplify kindness and make a positive impact in our community. And um, we do all kinds of projects and events during the year um, that are usually face-to-face. -face. And this year, of course, things have changed. And we have turned to mostly um, um, virtual events like this one. Um, we do, um, this coming Sunday, have our third face-to-face um, -face event at Cascadia Clusters, which is an opportunity for us to be outside face-to-face -face with people at a safe distance. And we will be helping with painting and construction of tiny homes, which are um, then distributed to um, houseless communities around Portland. And it's such a popular event. We're doing it for the third time. And, um, and for the first two, we did have to cut it off. Um, we had a waiting list. And we had to cut it off because um, to maintain that safe distancing, we can only take 24 people at a time. So anyway, that's this Sunday. And, um, and we do have spots open. Yes, we do. Oh, right and, now. So yeah. if you want to sign up, this is the time to do it. It is. The, we have a registration list, which is what helps us keep track of the numbers. And it's on our um, um, PC website. So it's positive charge pdx dot excuse me dot org and um, that's where you register so um, and then um, I'll tell you a little bit later um, about the next session after this and the next few sessions after this um, but before that just a couple housekeeping things it's really nice you don't have to but it's really nice to be able um, especially for Stephen to talk to people and with people. This is very engaging. It's very interactive and informative, but it's really good. It's helpful for the presenter to be able to speak to people rather than a black box with a name. So if you're comfortable and you want to show yourself, it makes for a very nice conversation um, as well as um, when you want to speak, um, when you're not speaking, go ahead and turn off your um, audio so we don't have any um, you know, stray noise, um, but feel, um, feel welcome at any time to chat through anything or, you know, Stephen will tell you more about the interactive process that he, that he prefers um, when, we're, when he's speaking. I'm so sorry about that. You have probably heard that email come through and I thought I turned my email off. Um, anyway, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan, who's going to introduce Stephen. And, um, we'll get going. Okay, go ahead, Benny. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, so this is our speaker of the week, Stephen. Um, I don't know where on your screen he is, but he's in the top right corner for me. <laughs> um, he's known among his friends as a brainiac with a love of learning. Um, he graduated with honors from Stanford University and spent the first 20 years of his career in the US, Europe, and Asia specializing in operations, logistics management, and marketing, and then founded a tech company uh, for the waste industry that sold in 2018. He became CEO of a medical billing firm and now consults for companies on operations and product and marketing projects. Um, he's the author of one nonfiction book and has written three novels with the fourth on the way. Uh, Stephen's journey, both personally and professionally, led to an insatiable curiosity about the mind and how it works, giving him a unique brand of clarity, energy, and optimism. And without further ado, here's Steven. Thank you very much. All right, let me fire this up and um, <clears throat> hang on just a sec. I'm going to share my screen. 
And we do that one and get PowerPoint going. Can you guys see that? Yay. Last time I got through like one or two slides. Um, dude, can you share your screen, please? Because we'd really like to see what you're talking about. So, mm -hmm. well, it's great to be here. And um, this is my second one. I absolutely love doing these. So it's my second presentation for Positive Charge. And I'm going to focus this section on how do you move ahead? Because that is the goal of any job that you have is not only to master it, but to look beyond it and say, what's next for me? Um, and to me, it's just absolutely key for your career. And that's really our focus for this evening. So um, thank you for that introduction, Jordan. Um, who the heck is this guy who's going to spend an hour with you? If you don't know me yet, as I mentioned in my last one, um, I'm a C-level executive. I just wrapped up a four-year stint as CEO of a medical billing company. And actually just today, um, I started a new consulting gig for uh, a company, they're doing about 17 million in revenue, but they're splitting from the parent company. They're trying to get on their feet. They're a mess. They don't have a lot of operations and that's just great. Throw me into that goo because I love straightening those types of things out. Um, as uh, Jordan mentioned, I love to write. So um, as I often say, when I have a bad day, my protagonist has a really bad day. So writing is a great, a great outlet for me. I am absolutely thrilled that my daughter is on here because that's the joy of my life is to be her dad. And I, I know Abby, she's got an eye roll going right now, like move on dad, let's move it. But um, I'm a father and I love to build. So this weekend just replaced four sections of my backyard fence. I like building stuff. I like building, you know, helping people build careers and whatever it is that needs building, I'm there. So with that as a brief introduction, mm -hmm. How did I approach this topic? Um, and I think the first and most basic thing is there is absolutely no formula that makes a great employee, okay? But from when I was researching this, I noticed that there's actually two pieces that I think really help move somebody forward. One are the personal attributes, like who are you as an individual and what are you bringing into the office? Now, if you combine that with the work practices, like how are you gonna actually perform your job? To me, the combination of those two things, when all those right elements are in place, that's what gets you promoted. But what was also so interesting as I was researching this is that there are generational differences. There are work ethic differences. How people approach jobs now, you know, I'm 59. I grew up in a totally different time when I started my career to where we are right now. And I found that that threaded its way through and I'll try and hit some of those high notes when we go through this. And there's also style differences. Obviously two people looking at the same topic can have very, very different opinions. We're experiencing that on the political front right now. So that also feeds into this. So the bottom line for me, the information I'm gonna to present tonight is that it's what I've learned because I've been an employee still am, even as a consultant, I'm still an employee working for somebody, but I've also been a manager for most of my career. And so I work with a lot of people and hired and promoted a lot of folks. So that's kind of what went into this. So I know this is all about how to get promoted, but I thought I would start with just a few basic slides right off the bat, how not to get promoted. Now, at some point, COVID is going to end. And you're all going to be back in the office, sharing office space. So the, one of the most important ways not to get promoted is to leave your lunch in the company refrigerator until it becomes a science experiment. Don't do that. That's really not good for your career. Actually, I found this. If you could believe that, that's actually a Ziploc bag that they sell. And you put your regular sandwich in, but it's got fake mold on the inside so people will leave it alone. And I'm not kidding, I was talking to somebody last night who told me they had to let a woman go because she had this habit of going into the company refrigerator and trying everybody's lunch. Yeah, don't do that either. So yeah, I know, Jordan's like, seriously? So <laughs> FYI, don't do that. Here's the second thing, very, very important. Um, make sure you forget your Zoom etiquette. 
especially if you're on national television. Like show up in a nice shirt and a jacket and forget to put your pants on. So number one, wear your pants, okay? Number two, make sure if you don't wanna get promoted, don't use the mute button. So we hear everything you're eating because that's so important in a, in a Zoom meeting. And the most important thing when you forget your Zoom etiquette because you really don't want to get promoted, make sure you let your kids and your animals roam free wherever you are because it's way more fun watching them running around in the background or the dog eating the cat or something like that. So um, the next thing, how not to get promoted, I call this, you need to master the art of lousy lying. So here's how this works. You call it, I can't be at the meeting today. I feel, I just feel terrible. I've been throwing up all night. I can't, oh, take care of yourself, please. And then an hour later, you post this on Facebook. Not a good idea. Unless you don't want to get promoted, then absolutely be a lousy liar. And so then I was thinking, what's the most important one? Like what would be the granddaddy of them all? How not to get promoted? And I found it. I absolutely found it. And I'm going to share it with you right now. Bring SpaghettiO Jello to the company potluck when you finally have one. Yeah. I guarantee you, not only will this not get you promoted, this is an excellent strategy for drawing unemployment, if that's your ultimate long-term goal. So I just wanted to start the talk off with that. Are there any questions about this so far? Or should I really move on before everybody gets nauseated? So... <laughs> All right, so um, on a slightly more serious note, so going back a little bit, I talked about the personal attributes and I wanna to touch on those first and then we'll go into what are the various work skills that you can bring with. So I'm gonna throw you know, a series of adjectives at you, all of which are intuitive, but what do I mean by this? So the first one is employees that tend to move forward are ones that are honest. What do I mean by that? You never sugarcoat. If somebody asks you for the truth about what's going on with a particular business issue, you never sugarcoat it. You call it as it is, very straightforward, because you're bringing your personal integrity. In all of your business dealings, honesty is the most fundamental thing that you're bringing. The next attribute for me is creative. You're approaching a situation with entirely new thinking. So a lot of the people around you keep seeing the same thing within the same boundaries and you come in and you're the one with the idea that sees it just a little bit differently or a lot differently. You're uncovering solutions that other people can't see. You're consistently that set of fresh eyes. And pretty soon that's what people begin to rely on you for. Positive. It's the, looking at life from that proverbial glass half full approach. So you're approaching your work and you're assuming that it can be done. And you're assuming that the team is going to win. And you're not that person that just always sucks the air out of the room. You know, we've all encountered that where there's always that naysayer. Now I'm not talking about you're just, you know, life is all good and you're looking through rose colored glasses, but your overall approach is that you're very positive about the work that's in front of you. The next attribute that I think I've always looked for in employees that move ahead is employees that are diligent. And what does that mean? You know, having or showing care and conscientiousness in one's work or duties. That's the book definition. But my view of it's always been that your manager knows that you, you, have you exquisitely care about the quality of your work product, whether it's an email, it's a project, they know that there's a great, great deal that you invest in the quality of it, that you take your responsibility seriously, and that you fully embrace your job description, every aspect of it, including the parts you don't like. So you remain very diligent about it. And that hooks to ambition. All right. You're looking beyond your job description, but you're not stepping over it. So you're doing everything that you're supposed to, but you're always trying to move, move further ahead. I learned this very quickly when I got my first job at Intel and I developed an interest in computer programming. 
And so I figured out how to master macros in Lotus 1, 2, 3, which was the precursor to Microsoft Excel. And I found a way to basically cut about two hours of work by just writing macros. That wasn't part of my job description, but when I did that, my boss was like, oh, well, could you do this? Could you do that? And that was the beginning of me realizing that my job description wasn't my limitation, it was my beginning. And that was very, very exciting for me to realize. So you've got this path forward that you're following, all right? And you're understanding that there's a way you can achieve that, but you're not steamrolling over to people. It's your excellence that propels you forward. It's not aggressiveness. Ambition is not about aggression. It's about knowing where you need to go and moving forward. In fact, I was just having a conversation with Abby about this. And you know, we were saying, what do you want to do? And we were sort of dancing around the idea that chief marketing officer is well within her scope, but she's just starting out. She's not going to get hired as a CMO tomorrow. And she realized that she's got to, you know, do the trench work. So she's totally fluent in the Adobe Creative Suite. She understands she's an excellent writer. She's got those skills, but I've known her to always be looking past them to say, if I mastered this or I got certified in that, I will step beyond. So that's what I mean by ambitious, which is very hooked to confidence. So ambition drives you. Confidence is what gets you to the finish line, especially when you hit the speed bumps and you're going to hit them. The project that you can't get people to work on, the issue that keeps tripping you up. So you know your strengths, but the big thing on confidence is that you also fully own what you don't know. And those two things go hand in hand together. If I could leave you with one piece of advice on business that you should carry with you the rest of your life, when somebody says, asks you a question and you don't know the answer, the most powerful words out of an employee to me as a manager is, I don't know, let me find out for you. So much better than you know, a baloney answer where I already know you don't know the answer. So that's part of confidence. I don't know, let me figure that out. That takes a confident person to, to, to say, but important too, confidence is not arrogance. Confidence is an internal strength of knowing what you know, knowing what you don't know, and then owning both of those, which I just think is magical when you get that in an employee. And that's what hooks also to humility, because it's the idea of, of saying you're so confident in what you do, you don't need to parade it around to everybody. You don't need to show off. You don't need to toot your own horn, because your accomplishments speak for themselves. And it's also not a false humility. Oh, you know, my greatest weakness is I work too hard. That's not humble. That's overconfidence. The idea is I know what I know, I know what I don't know, and there's probably stuff I don't know, I don't know, and I'll get to that when it presents itself. But that's all approached from a place of great humility, and you can always spot that in an employee. Another one that I love in employees that I tend to promote are detail-oriented, people that are very detail-oriented. I can give you a perfect example of that. And again, I know Abby's gonna like, dad, please, but small stuff doesn't get by her. So she just created a website. And we, I was looking through this thing and it was extraordinary how she picked every detail, the color scheme, the font, the look and the graphics. It was amazing to see the small stuff. Now, being the nerd that I am, I said, you want to go a detail on a detail? That little icon in the browser at the very top that has a logo on it, it's called a favicon. I said, make one of those. That's like a little detail on a detail. But employees that are very detail-oriented, they make a habit of noticing the small stuff, are very, very potent material to get promoted. But here's one word of caution. Detail-oriented also means knowing when 80% is good enough and it's time to move on. It doesn't mean dotting every I and crossing every T. It's that balance of knowing you catch what a lot of people either don't want to put the effort into or they think 50% is good enough and that doesn't sit with you, but you also know when to let go and move on. 
Now, another attribute that I think is very important is what I call self-aware. And that is an employee that understands three dynamics, the people, the project that they're working on, and the work itself or the workload. And they're able within that to self-correct, which means they need minimal management and minimal guidance because they've also got that confidence to be able to take an assignment and rocket it forward. So I think self-aware and knowing where you are in your surroundings is very important, which the last one I put in there is passion. You're passionate for the company mission. You have passion um, about your job and you have passion about the clients that you serve, whether it's an internal customer or an external customer. I was, I was talking to my girlfriend about this and she said, you know who, how I know if somebody has passion when she's interviewing or when somebody has passion for a job is she'll ask them, what do we do? What does our company do? And if that person can't give you the elevator pitch, they don't have the passion. If you haven't taken the time to read the website and be able to summarize what they do in a sentence or two, if you've worked at a firm for five years and you can't articulate the 30 second elevator pitch, guess what you're missing? And, and that passion lights up a room. It lights up a meeting. It's, in, it's that infectious enthusiasm that somebody brings. So, Here's the summary of it, right? And you're probably thinking, okay, I gotta be honest and creative, but how in the world am I gonna bring that in the front door every single day? Because, you know, I gotta be one of these in order to do it, right? I'm not talking about that you've got to be the perfect employee where you walk in the front door and the clouds part and violins play and there's a chorus that goes, oh, that's not what I'm trying to get across here. What I'm suggesting is like any human being, you're showing up to work with all the rest of your life in tow, right? You know, you had a flat tire, the dog, you know, threw up on the carpet, all that stuff that happens to us in life. You had an argument with someone close to you. You're going to bring that with you. But the personal attributes that I've talked about, those are employees that are able to say, yes, I've got that under control. It's not going to directly impact what I need to get done. And I can refocus when I walk through that sort of invisible barrier in the front door. I'm present. I'm here. It's time to get to work. And I think that's so important for employees that are able to grab from all these attributes and put it to work for them as best as they can on any given day. And some days you may only have one. And some days you can have three and some days when you are firing on all cylinders, you've mastered every one. And those are the days that you finish the project and people are like, oh my gosh, who are you right now? And we've all had those. And that's the beauty of being a good employee because the ones that give move forward are the ones that are able to grab them fairly often and put them to work in combination. So, that's kind of where I'm at as far as where I think personal attributes come in. So I want to talk next about work attributes, but let me ask any, any questions so far or keep rolling. Awesome. Okay. So I've told you about who, who is it that comes in the office and sits down at that desk at eight, eight in the morning. Now I want to talk about what is it that they do? How do they execute the job? So the word I put in here is committed. Again, this is someone that is totally zeroed in on the mission and the vision. This is the person who's so committed, they are the one that always goes the extra mile. This is the person in the meeting that says, I think you ought to do X, Y, Z. And everybody says, no, nope, we're going to do ABC. And they absolutely don't like it, but they execute the consensus anyway. That is what it means to be committed because you're committed beyond your own agenda. You are committed to what the mission is and where everybody's headed. Committed means I can roll with the bad times because every company's gonna have them. Everybody's gonna have difficulties. So you're able to roll with those. Now the next piece that I have always found is really almost like rocket fuel in the promotion arena is the ability to multitask. And what I mean by that is somebody 
that can work on multiple priorities at the same time and execute all of them without getting flustered. All right, they're able to easily move between different tasks. And I'm, okay, I'm doing marketing right now. I got to jump into the numbers and then I have to get on a conference call and talk to a customer. The ability to move through that workload. To me, it's the ability really to move between strategic and tactical. And what I mean by that is strategic thinking is we're here, we need to be here. What's the plan? How do I create what we need to create? How do I figure out a process by which we can get from A to B. Tactical is, these are the action items that I need to execute in order to actually put that into motion. And I'm telling you, it is hard to find individuals that can move from 30,000 feet down to the weeds and back up again. In truth, the way it works is 30,000 weeds, 10,000 weeds, 25,000, 15,000, and you're moving back and forth because Sometimes you have to manage it and sometimes you have to do it. And if you have the ability to move between strategic and tactical, that's very potent. Now imagine marrying that with multi-skilled, all right? I have command of a broad range of tools. I have technical capabilities. I have interpersonal skills and I have content skills. So again, I'm going to bring up my daughter. All right. She clearly has the command of the technical side of marketing. Yep. I mean, I've seen her web programming. I've seen her, her uh, digital drawing. Boom. Adobe stuff done. Microsoft Office Suite done. So I've got the technical side, but she's got fabulous and a personal skill. She's very good with people. When we were talking about the website, she showed me this amazing video, but she said in a very humble sort of way, yeah, dad, I was actually the one that led the team because I couldn't get him focused. So I was able to cajole and, and, and push and move and we got to the finish line. That's in her personal skills. Not everybody has those. And then clearly she understands the content. I know marketing, which is very different than I know Adobe Photoshop. And somebody that's able to master that I think is very, very important. So interpersonal are things like negotiation, facilitation, content, things like certification, specific industry knowledge. And I think what wraps around that is this, continuous education. I never stop in any of these three areas. There's always something more to learn. And it could be that there's some sort of certification I can go for or a class or I'm just absorbing more knowledge as we move forward. But I think if you're able to combine multitasking with multi-skilled, yeah, get out of the way because that is a very potent combination for moving forward. So now there's this more subtle one, what I call dependable, all right? This is the person who I know will follow through or most important, tell me when they can't. So I'm never surprised. In fact, I just thought of this, the hierarchy. Let me see if I can get this down in my head. So from best to worst, a timely surprise of good news. Oh, that's just great. You know, um, you know what? On Tuesday of next week, I'm going to bring you great news. Oh, good. I got something to look forward to. Next down, number two, an untimely surprise of good news. Guess what just happened? We just got that contract. That's fabulous. All right. Number three, an, a uh, timely surprise of bad news. Hey, boss, tomorrow I need to meet with you and I don't have something good I have to tell you. You're like, okay, I got it. And then there's number four an untimely surprise of bad news. All right, guess what? The world just blew up on this account. The gap between three and four is a chasm compared to the gap between each of the other ones. People who follow through and are dependable never, ever, ever, unless the sky is falling, give me that fourth scenario. All right? Because when I ask, they always come through
some point, boss always goes to the director and I never knew who was going to walk in the front door. Are they going to be in a good mood? Are they going to be in a bad mood? Are they going to be productive or are they going to be temperamental in this meeting? And, and it gets exhausting having to manage somebody like that as opposed to that person who's pretty much the same one every day. And boy, they're the ones that you just naturally get to gravitate to because there's a lot of work to be done and you want, you want somebody dependable on it, which means when there's a problem, you're the first one that they're going to turn to. So the next piece I'd say is driven people that are self motivated. They're enthusiastic. They're eager and they never take the easy way out. They always try and find a solution, which means they're gonna keep digging for answers in order to get the results they need. And they're the ones that tend to set the long-term goals for themselves. So driven, I think is very, very important. This piece I'm gonna talk about, here's a little controversial, okay? And I call it hardworking. And I'm not looking at this from the perspective of somebody who's 59 and all this. I'm trying to make a very specific point here. This is somebody that doesn't leave at 5.01 PM. Now I get the concept of work-life balance. I've taught courses in it. And I understand how important it is to not have your work life consume you like it did in the eighties and the nineties where I really grew up in the meat of my career. Um, but even with work-life balance, hardworking employees put in extra hours, period, which means it goes with extra effort. They're going the extra mile, all right? And I'm saying this because I guarantee you, there is always going to be somebody who's gonna be willing to work at least as hard, if not harder than you. And where you may be trying to draw a work-life balance, somebody else is gonna say, you know what? I'm looking at, at trying to get that promotion or try to get to that next level. And I'm going to put the hours in that I need to do it. And so it's a line that you draw. And I'm not suggesting here, work yourself to the bone until you burn out your third year. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that hard work and extra effort is going to get you noticed compared to the person that may do a phenomenal job but there's a cutoff that they'll have. And sometimes business doesn't work on that kind of schedule. My experience has been that hardworking employees that can step in and offer that extra effort tend to be noticed more by management. Now, another key piece for me is leadership. Okay. This is somebody who praises publicly and criticizes privately and quietly. They're not the one that overtly says, geez, this meeting really stinks. I don't like being here. So I think that's very important. I think a leader mentors. They mentor because they're trying to transfer skill and knowledge and they are not threatened by that. If I teach this person something, it's not, I don't want to hold it back because I'm afraid I'm not going to get promoted because the focus is on the team, not on yourself. Leaders mediate and resolve conflict. Props to you if you spot brewing conflict and you can diffuse it. Leaders admit their mistakes and leaders don't judge. They don't lead with sort of a holier than that. Well, how could you not know that? Well, okay, I'll do it because I'm a leader. That's not leading. That borders on intimidation. And this is one thing that's guided me through my career, folks. Higher to your weakness. Never be afraid to admit, I have no idea about this. I'm going to hire somebody that knows more than I do. That's what I think a leader does. When you exhibit these leadership skills, you're going to get noticed and promoted. Now, another piece I think is very important is being apolitical. I love this quote from, from Tom Hanks. And I'm not apolitical. I'm very specific in my politics. But a lot of the time, it's nobody's business unless you're over at my house having dinner. All right. What I mean is politics exist. They exist in every organization and you never want to be naive enough to think that they don't. However, wherever possible, try not to engage in them and try and hug the center. Take a stand if you have to, that's best for the company when you can't and respect the chain of command. 
Now, here's where this ends. If there is behavior that is misogynistic, that's racist, if you're seeing um, behavior that is immoral, unethical, breach of fiduciary responsibility, any of those things, apolitical ends. And you draw the line and says, no, because I am a team player and I believe in the mission of this company, that behavior does not work. And I don't care what politics are involved in it. But I'm really talking more about the day-to-day -day flow of business. Where possible, be the person that doesn't play the politics, be the person that stands back from it and tries to move beyond it. All right. Another work attribute, I think, are those that take initiative. You're always tinkering. Nothing, you know, this process, if only I could solve this step, we could save an hour. Or that process would eliminate two extra meetings. It's somebody that brings me a problem and at least two solutions to fix it. I cannot tell you how frustrating it is to have an employee that's really good at pointing out problems. Great, thanks for sharing but leaves it to everybody else to try and figure out how to fix it. So employees that get promoted are the ones that are solution oriented. They're the first to volunteer. As I mentioned earlier, they see their job description as the starting point, not the boundary. So they're looking at their industry. They're looking at their environment. They're understanding what are best practices in other, in, in other departments in our company. Or I was talking to somebody and they're kind of in the same industry and they do this and you bring that back in and you take the initiative um, to make that happen. Where I learned about this was back at Intel and as I really moved from Lotus to actual real programming in DBase 3 and we were moving manufacturing systems, I figured out how to really program real stuff that started saving time. And we all went to this big meeting, we were in this huge auditorium and the vendor was saying, yeah, we have to you know, implement this brand new manufacturing planning system, but it has to start with everybody submitting changes they wanna to make to the way we build the product, which means we need a document in order for people to fill out and you guys don't have that. And I don't know how you're ever gonna get it. And my boss, Dan, I remember I was sitting in toward the back on an aisle seat and Dan was like 10 rows up on an aisle seat and all I saw was Dan turn around and just lean over, look back at me and smile. And that was Dan's way of saying, guess what? You're a planner. You set the master schedule for the factory, but guess what? You're now gonna program this new source document program that we need. Because he knew I was gonna take the initiative to do it anyway. So he just smiled and said, when's it gonna be done? You know, that's what he communicated in that. And I did it and I loved it. And guess what happened at the end of the year, guys? I went from a grade four to a grade five. And that was on there, that Stephen took the initiative to learn how to program, which was outside of his job description. It was very exciting. So that's what I mean by understanding your industry environment and initiative to bring best practices in. So I have three more of these left as I start to wrap up. So the last three, and I kind of leave these to the end, are what I call company first. And those employees that I have promoted are ones that give more than they take. They balance their goals against the firm's needs. And in my view, in the right company, you know, who has the right ethics in place, that performance is going to get rewarded. The easiest example I can get is from all the interviews that I've done. When I'm interviewing somebody, and a lion's share of their questions are, can you tell me what your time off policy is? Can you tell me how much vacation I get? Can you tell me what your sick leave policy is? When do benefit, you know, it's like, okay, this is telling me, is this person putting the company first? Are they the ones that are going to want, what can the company do for them? When I have so much I need to accomplish and I want to see what they could also do for the company because it's a relationship, folks. It's a give and a take. It's not that the company pulls every ounce of energy and love and commitment that you have and then throws you off on the side. I've worked for companies that have done that. But really, it's about a symbiotic relationship between what both can give and both can take. And that's what I mean by company first. And it's really focusing on those gaps, the gaps between where is it that the company needs some work 
that I could fill in because I know it's important to the overall mission of our firm. Another attribute that to me is so important is being a great communicator. And that means active listening. It means that conversations are two-way exchanges, not what I'm hearing a lot of, which is someone goes on for five minutes a shot before you can even get your way into the conversation. I'm noticing a lot of that now. People want to hear themselves instead of saying their point, laying back, letting somebody having an exchange going back and forth. Someone that doesn't interrupt. I was in a meeting today with two benefits brokers trying to pitch becoming the new benefits broker for this company. And as the owner started speaking, this one woman kept interrupting him. Guess who's not going to be the benefits broker at this company? Because you've got to be able to show that you can listen. But communicating is also about being a great writer. One of the things I'm enjoying right now is, as my girlfriend has been sending me all the typos she's seen on everybody's resume, like warehouse, W-H-E-R-E-H-O-U-S-E. -E. You know, Home Depot, D-E-P-I-T. Okay, if that's showing up in your emails, if that's showing up in your PowerPoints, that says something about your communication skills. It's that passion to communicate with somebody that really shines through. And the last attribute for me is consistency. This ties very much back with that dependability piece. As I said, it's the same person that shows up every day. Their mood, their temperament, all of it's constant. And all of it is there because they're embracing that whole workload including the stuff they don't like. And that to me is what really makes the difference. I can name you half of the stuff I have to do. I didn't like today. I walked around this company that's in the middle of a personal property tax review. And, I, and I'm sitting here and I'm not kidding guys, here it is, writing down all the assets that weren't on their list, writing little tags on post-it notes until I get an asset tags. You think that was fun as a former CEO? But you know what? Part of what he hired me to do, because the other part of it was me on the phone with the county assessor talking business to business and how I'm going to submit this and then doing all that nerd stuff. It's all part of it. It's all part of executing your duties. And I think the person that embraces their entire workload consistently day in and day out is the one that's going to get promoted. So I'd close by saying, like I said in the beginning, there's no such thing as a perfect employee. But if I boiled it down to math, extra effort plus extra mile, I'm going to stand out. Work hard, work smart. In general, you're going to advance. So that was a lot of information. Now let me step back and feel free to undo your mic and fire off any questions. I'd love to hear them. That was awesome. Thanks. Any questions from anybody? Come on, I couldn't have covered it all. I know. I'll ask a question. Please. Okay. So um, you talked a lot about commitment and loyalty and allegiance and hard work and um, identifying, let me see, I'm trying to look at my notes here. Um, you talked about um, putting in the hard work and the hours um, and maintaining an adequate uh, work-life balance. Yeah. But still, you want to still show your loyalty and allegiance to the company. How do you suggest identifying that line so that you don't cross the line? You have to define the line and identify the line so you don't cross the line so that you can prevent short and long-term burnout because that's both advantageous, not only to use the employee, but yeah. also advantageous to the employer. Yeah, no, that's, that's such a good question. And, and what I could tell you is A, there is no formula for that either. The way I've always done it is first of all, I noticed that if I am a grouch at the office, if I have lost hold of even one of those uh, personal attributes that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, that's usually where the self-aware piece comes in. I know I've overdone it. Or if I'm barking more than I'm wagging, you know, I can tell, I can feel it in there. And then I have to be honest with myself. Okay, dude, you need to step back a little bit. Um, 
some of it is also soliciting feedback on a regular basis. Um, you know, how am I doing? Where are we on this? People are pretty good at saying, you know what, you're, I've noticed you're pretty burnt out on this, or we're not making as much progress as we should. Or if I notice feedback that started to come through email or whatever, that, that we were, we were really moving and now we kind of are slowing or maybe even stopping. Those are clues too, that I may be less effective. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I, for me, what's always worked is I've just always done 60 hour work weeks. Mm -hmm. It's part of it is I love to work and I find it so interesting. And I'm so fired up by the challenge of somebody saying, you can't blow that candle out. Oh, don't tell me I can't blow that candle out yeah. because then I'm going to spend all my time figuring out how I'm going to blow that candle out. It's the way I'm wired. Mm -hmm. And that just, you know, comes from my dad and my grandpa mostly by watching them work. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say self-monitoring and asking for feedback. Um, and then you also just have to know what works for you. Because, I mean, I, I look at Abby, for example, and how she works. She probably can accomplish in 50 hours what I could do in 60. Some people, and again, I think this is a promotable skill, have the ability to generate a lot more work in the same hour either by its quality or its, or its quantity. And I think if you kind of know, man, I'm looking all around me and I'm seeing kind of not mediocrity because that's sort of judgmental, but here's the truth. I actually can get more done than Joe, Fred, Mary, and Sam. And I could do that in 50 hours and that's my limit. I'm done after that. That's another way of addressing that. So I think knowing what you can pump out in X number of hours is helpful. So did, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Super. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so we, you talked earlier about knowing like with your job description, having that be um, not your limitation, but your beginning yeah. and knowing when to go further than that. Um, and that's something I always really like to do, but how do you find that balance in between like trying to push further and find new things that you can do versus overstepping your position? Yeah, great question. Well, first of all, make sure that you have it leaned over the cubicle wall, read the job just or two job. <laughs> That's, that's sort of an obvious way to is Dave Chamberlain was his name. I said, Dave, I have this crazy idea. And he looked and I worked it out with him. And then he said, give it a try. I did it. I showed it. And then we tried it out. Boom. Suddenly that became the new department standard. And I became the department nerd who knew how to do Lotus one, two, three macros. So some of it was checking in, but some of it is I looked and I saw that nobody else was, um, was actually taking initiative on something that clearly was sitting right then and there. Um, you know, I could think of so many instances where a problem was brought up and everybody said, yep, we acknowledge it's a problem, but nobody was doing anything about it. At that point, that's where I said, you know what, I'm just grabbing and running with that thing. I didn't mean to check and I just did it because again, it was a known entity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so sometimes it's okay too, to look and discuss this, but I see this as a gap that I could fill there. I would say in that third instance, just be careful, think it through. Will I be stepping on somebody's toes? That's where you start thinking maybe about the politics. If I did this, is that possibly I'm intruding on somebody else's job? Do you and think if you feel like, you know what, this feels like a company gap, but I don't think anybody's going to get upset for doing that. I think at that point, it would be fine to take initiative without really checking in with anybody and saying, look what I just did. And I think, Jordan, it's, it's really being aware of your surroundings and figuring out for this particular thing I'm trying to do, what makes sense, what approach makes sense. If you do um, 
think of something that might be a gap, but are worried that it might be infringing on somebody else's position, do you think it's appropriate to go to the person whose position it is yeah. and talk to them about it? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I say respect the chain of command. But right. a lot of companies, if they're well organized, have really good um, either matrix management or a lot of open doors. So the best thing that you can do is to go to somebody who may say, hey, you know what, that is my, that's my sandbox. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you came in because I've been stuck on that. Yeah. Do you think that you might be able to help? I can't tell you when I was at Intel and Wang in particular, because there are big Fortune 500 companies where there's lots of sandboxes, to have somebody from another division come in and say, I have this problem and they acknowledge it and two cross-divisional employees solve the problem together, in larger corporations, they love that. Building bridges between disparate departments is very important. In startups, in small companies, it's less important because everybody wears a lot of hats anyway. But in larger firms, where you're building bridges between you know, manufacturing and marketing, between division A and B, it's huge. So I would say at that point, absolutely approach the person. I'd be willing to bet you're going to find a willing person that says, please help me fix this. And now you've got a partner. Now you've got a project. And each person's boss is going to say, "Yep, yeah, that's promotion material right there. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Um, Rachel chatted a question. This looks great. How do you advocate for yourself when you feel you deserve a promotion? I know some companies don't have formal channels for year over year promotion or upward mobility. Um, wow. So um, I'm gonna tell you a story very briefly. Um, in one of the startups I was involved in, I worked for the same salary for 11 years. And I watched the CEO hire other people with less responsibility, give them larger titles and pay him more money. And I knew he'd pay more money because I did all the finances in the company. And I walked in after I wrote a three page, here's everything that I've accomplished. And um, I brought it to, to my boss, who was the CEO. And uh, he basically said, you know, we expect you to be doing these things and we pay you what we pay you because you do them and basically don't ever come in and ask for a raise again and threw me out of his office. And I quit three months later. So there's, I think part of the answer is in the question. You have to advocate for yourself because there is no better advocate than you, okay? The basic rule of survival is that it starts with you first. Now that doesn't mean you go, you know, running in and you slam down and you say, I've been blah, 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 blah. And you need to X, Y, Z. I mean, obviously nobody's going to respond to that. But um, when I took over my last company as CEO, they've been in business for 10 years and never, ever had done employee valuations ever. And half the people had also never had a raise. So one of the first things I did was implement employee evaluations. But in the absence of having those, first of all, I can give you a fabulous format that we used to use. I, I actually used my old Intel and Wang formats. I mushed them together. I'll give you one so you can self-evaluate and write yourself your own evaluation that you can then take in. All right, so if you need that, let me know and I'll share that with you. Always keep that tucked away. And there's nothing wrong with sitting down with your manager and just saying, I've been here for 18 months and I, uh, you can see a pattern of increasing responsibility. You can see a pattern of really, really good work product. And I'd like to talk to you about where I'm headed, both from the salary and from a job responsibility standpoint. Now, if you get the same thing that I got, which is don't ever come in here and talk to me about that again. You need to think about whether or not you're employed in the right place. And then you're in that awful balance of we're in COVID, jobs are hard to find, do I quit? Um, but, you know, I, again, going back to my daughter, Abby, she had the courage to leave a job that wasn't working for her. And there are consequences to that, but she values her contribution 
and she values what she can bring to the company enough to know when there's now an imbalance. And that is sometimes the outcome that you have to face. But I would start by saying, grab that confidence, grab that humility, grab that drive, evaluate yourself and sit down and say, it's time. It's time to have that conversation. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. And good managers and good, good companies will reward that. You may not get everything you want, but at minimum, you should be heard. Awesome. Thank you. And picking off of that question, something that I've been noticing has been happening to more and more of my friends, especially during COVID, is getting offered promotions without a raise um, because of the various financial situations happening at companies nowadays. Yeah. Do you have suggestions for how to navigate that when you do get offered this promotion, however, you feel that you also deserve more money as well? Yeah. Yeah, boy, let me start by saying there's one basic rule in business and cash is king. Okay, so if revenues have dropped 30% and they were able to keep all the employees on staff, you, you, know, you, can't, you can't give money where it's not there. I will say at the same time, there's, you can usually find some creative ways to offer something. So in, in the extraordinary times that we're in right now, and I've gone through this you know, over my 30 some odd years of career. I've gone through this where there are times where you take the promotion, you don't take the money. So at this one job I was telling you was that, you know, I went from founder uh, all the way up to senior vice president without ever getting a raise. And when I asked for it, it was denied. That's when I made the decision to leave, but it was different economic times at that point. So it is, as you look at your career, you have to look at your career as a 30 to 40 year project, okay? And sometimes in that continuum, which is a long time, especially when you're in the beginning of it, it may be wise to take the promotion and ask for the money, but if it's not there, say, it's in my best interest right now that this experience I'm about to get and this increase in responsibility will probably help me further down the road. Like I'll be able to apply for higher end positions that will pay for more. And I'm willing to do it for a year for the same salary or six months or whatever you feel is the time frame that's appropriate, where the experience outweighs the feeling of being taken advantage of. All right. And then you'd say, all right, I'm willing to do that for a time. But you also have to know where your limit is. And so if you feel that, say, during that one year period, they're gradually piling more and more and more on like above and beyond the promotion that they gave you. And you begin to feel like uh, you are being taken advantage of at that point, you may need to say, I'm either going to leave the job or I need to have a more stern conversation. Um, but I would go back and say the same thing. There's nothing wrong with asking, uh, may I have a raise with this promotion? What's the plan for that? And if they say, we just can't afford it right now, then it puts the decision back to you and it's not an easy one. But um, I think it's a balance between if this could be a door opener for you and you're willing to do it for a certain period of time and you know where that boundary is, it might be in your best interest to take the lateral, you know, in terms of salary, but take the promo in terms of responsibility and title, because that may be an extra 40 or 50 grand a year when you jump out of the job that you're in and go and apply to a company that really can't afford to pay for that position, as long as you feel you're not being taken advantage of. Does that help? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. You <laughs> I think a lot of people are dealing with that right now. So it's just- I've no doubt. I've no doubt. And, and there's, it's a very fine line. You know, that's a razor blade that you have to dance on. Um, because companies are having a hard time. It is a tough economy out there, despite all the rosiness coming from, you know, from the government. It's a tough time out there. And, um, and so this is one of, those, one of those ebbs and flows and phases that we're going through. Awesome. Thank you. You know, Stephen, I was just going to say that um, it's possible that even if a company doesn't have the same income, maybe their revenues have dropped, it's also possible that you can negotiate um, benefits temporary. Great. Yeah, that's great. The only thing that's, that you have to be careful of there is in most instances, benefits have to be applied universally across all employees. 
you know, so right. it depends on which benefit you're talking about. At the C level, you can negotiate a separate package, but if you're sort of rank and file, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of do one, do for all. So you have to be very careful there. But mm -hmm. if there is some room on benefit, it could be flexible time. That's what I was talking about. You know, yeah. PTO or something like that. Um, the HR, um, HR will be involved in that if special accommodations are made, but mm -hmm. it is feasible to possibly do non-monetary compensation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was great. Great, great question. It was really good feedback. Anything else anybody has on their mind? Terrific. <laughs> thank you for the applause, Ruthie. That was very good. That was yeah, great. this has been awesome. Thank you. You bet. Really good. Hey, Stephen, thank you. Can we um, make your slide presentation available? Absolutely. Excellent. That's so great. And I think um, a lot of people are going to benefit by it. Um, absolutely. In the afterlife, because that was incredible. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Really, very good. Yes, thank you. And um, let's see, I was going to, oh, I was, oh, that's right, I, I got the slides. And then I wanted to mention before we, before everybody heads out, um, Stephen will also be talking again on um, September 8th about finding your right life to boldly go where you may have not considered before. Um, and um, I don't know if you wanted to give a sneak preview of that. No, I'll wait for my next video. But, you know, okay. it's, it, I alluded to this. I, yeah, say no, and here I go. So, um, but I alluded to this a little bit in my first talk, which is, um, I don't know if you were there, but I gave the four stages of career. You know, you could do one thing for a long time in one industry. You could do one thing for a long time in multiple industries. You could do multiple things in one industry of marketing, finance, in the food industry. Or you do what I do, which is I've had all the different jobs in the company in a whole range of different industries. And there are pros and cons to both. And um, it's been a really interesting journey, which I just, just cautioned Abby on like, don't fall into it. I got lucky at the end, I fell into the CEO and I realized actually I didn't have a path without realizing it, but it was way too accidental. And I want to touch on that because it also involves what do you love? What's your passion? Mm -hmm. What is it that just like, I'm not talking about that gets me out of bed every morning. I'm talking about that there's a spring in your mattress that throws you out of bed into the shower that all the shower and makeup and all that. It's a waste of my time because I want to get to my desk because I can't wait to get started. That's what I'm talking about. That's the passion that not just gets you promoted. That's just those people that are like, I can't believe they're paying me to do this. Like, really? What is that? What does it take to get that, to tap into that gusher? So that's kind of what I want to focus on on that next one. That's awesome. So that's why I'm not going to talk about it preview. Okay. <laughs> that's great. I love it. Oh my gosh. So we have, thank you for that. And we, um, next week, so we have Sunday's Cascadia clusters. And um, for those of you in Portland, um, you can sign up uh, for that. That'll be, um, you can sign up on our website, which is, again, it's positivechargepdx.org. And you can sign up, register for that. And then next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, we have Steven Saltzman, and he is going to do a fascinating talk about the top technology transitions that will change your life and your career opportunities. Um, and then um, we take a week off, and then Steven, this Steven Kaufman, will come back. Um, and then we just, we just have an amazing lineup. And that lineup is also on the same, our same website, it's positivechargepdx.org slash mentors. And you can see the whole lineup and uh, schedule and presenters and everything there. So anyway, we want to um, thank all of you for coming and um, stay safe and stay healthy, wear a mask, and um, have a really nice evening. Thanks, folks. That was fun. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye.